Greetings, everyone. My name is Professor Les Henry, and welcome to the Outer View, where reason comes first. Today, I'm joined by my wonderful sister, Sister Natrima. Sister Natrima, how are you doing? I'm fine. How are you? I'm evening? blessed, you know, can't complain. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Yes, um, my name's Natrima. Uh, I was born in Lucian, born in the UK. My family, parents were born in Ghana, so that's where my origins lie. I say that I'm a product of Lucian because I was born here, grew up here, educated largely here. So I call myself like an import unofficially by way of Africa. But that's, and to, to say my background is um, I'm a writer. Um, I wrote my first book, Melanin Monologues, in 2015. And I wrote a second book in 2019. Uh, called Young Black Entrepreneurs. Okay. Um, and I'm in, well, when I've got experience of working in a college further education department of ESOL and functional skills, adult learning, and I work in a library as well. And I just do jobs that help me progress and fund what I'd like to do in terms of my writing. And I have a small company called the Wordsmith Workshop Limited. And that's a little business that I started to be a platform in order to produce my books independently. Yeah. So that's why I started that. As a, and my saying is, independence retains authenticity. So <laughs> I could be as authentic as I want to. Absolutely. That's why I've, I've published a couple of my books. You know, I offer them to publishers. They either want yeah. me to make extensive changes which will detract from the message. So I just put them out myself. So yeah. you know, again, respect, because why should we wait for anyone else to do that for us? You know, why? Especially, especially if we've got something important to say. Absolutely. Um, One of the things I, wanna, I want to ask you, and I know you've got a keen interest in this, is how do you think us as Africans, you know, peoples of African ancestry, black people in the diaspora, what do you think are the lessons that we can learn from racism, but how can we use that in a practical way to develop ourselves? A practical way is, I think that we need to understand the history of it. We need to understand why it happens in order to be able to, to move forward and find solutions as we're at the receiving end of it. And I think my views, uh, uh, my view in that sense has stemmed from something, an interview I watched a long time ago by Dr. Frances Cross Welsing, who's, I believe, a black psychologist. She's now yeah, no longer with us. And she said, if you understand like the system of racism, white supremacy, however you label that oppression, because, I mean, it's called different things, but it essentially means the same thing. It says, if you understand that system, then nothing else will really confuse you. You'll understand that some of what we're countering now has happened before you'll understand what we would do before in order to counter it or in order to progress. So I think understanding the why, understanding the patterns, the trend and the motive, the agendas of it. And um, in understanding the history of it, it may even help us to preempt what direction things are going in. Yeah, absolutely. Because you often see scholars and psychologists and academics like yourself say, you know, I told people this was going to happen. Because you're well read, you understand what has happened, you've, you've yeah. educated yourself about that. So that's, that's what I say in a way, understand it, read. So, so Sis Natrima, you know, you spoke about the influences of people like um, Dr. Francis Chris Wilson, but what about the influences closer to home? So, so you know, you grew up in Lewisham, I grew up in Lewisham, you were born in Lewisham, I was born in Lewisham, <laughs> but things were against us to acknowledge and recognize ourselves as Africans. You know, when I was at school, it would be a different experience from when you were at school, but I know you still got it. So, and I know one of the things about talking to you is you're very proud of your Ghanaian heritage and you're very proud to be, you know, an African person, but also an African person in the diaspora. So mm -hmm. where does that actually stem from in your, in your experience? That stems from that stems from being exposed to my culture firsthand. And I always say to my mum, I'm very grateful that at such a young age, she took me back home to visit for a few months because 
where I was at the time, I think we're talking about the very late 1980s, I was having quite a difficult time at school. And I'm not proud to say that um, it was from some of my fellow black students, and I'm not pointing the finger at the blame, I'm just saying it's an right. observation. You're being honest, yeah. it's the history. So how old would you have been, yeah. around six, seven? I was about six years old when I went to Ghana for the first time. And by then I'd been at school for about two years, and I'd, I'd encountered a lot of bullying about my skin tone, about having such a distinctive African surname and about being African, about being a black African person. And, you know, it was things like if we watched a documentary at school, the African in a mud hut in our books, it was the African, with the swollen belly. And that is a perspective of Africa, but it's only one perspective of a continent with over 50 countries in it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So going, going back to Ghana and seeing firsthand, seeing people live in huge amounts, vast amounts of land, educated, dignified, clean, presentable, beautiful people. And that changed my whole view. So I went from school to feeling quite embarrassed about being African to then making that transition to feeling proud but questioning the things I was presented with so when somebody would say oh no you're an African or what have you or you know Africans you clean batty you do this I was like well Ghana's not really like that yeah. I'm telling you oh no 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 it's not really but I I mean it was liberating for me I understood that and it wasn't my responsibility to make them understand that but that was enlightening for me. Yeah. That's and a journey actually, you have to make on your own. But that's actually a beautiful point that you make there, you know, and this is what I say to people. It's not incumbent upon you to teach people that. You know, they can come to you with their ignorance and, you know, most of us went through that. Fortunately, because my, I've always said my mum and dad were probably Garveyites without knowing it. <laughs> because my dad and the experiences he had and he had to buy a house in 1953 or something like that yeah we always had lodgers so mm. we had lodgers from every island you could think of in the caribbean cool. we had people from from the continent nigerians in particular nigerian um families so we grew up like that so we didn't. We were not allowed to invest in this African bobo and small island, big island. We were into none of that because my dad knew, like many of that generation, we were all in the same boat. White people did. You think white people were going to say, oh, "Are you from Ghana? Are you from whatever?" I remember there was a, a, a cricketer. I think he was um, Bajan. Don't beat me mm -hmm. if it wasn't. The ironically named Marlon Black, who when he was in Australia with some. Cricketers, this was in the 90s. He was in Australia with, you know, the West Indian cricket team. Um, they were abused by some Aussie racists. Mm -hmm. Them run. He stayed. They've literally bust his head open. And in the paper, this is what he said in the paper. I've still got the clip. I still use it. He said, it was unfortunate, a misunderstanding. I think they thought we were African people. That's what he actually said. So to me, to hear someone like you saying, you know, from such a tender age, you realised that when you went home, you saw the good, the bad, the ugly and the indifferent. And these are the kind of things what they don't want us to understand in the West. So they like to portray Africa as a country. Even the other day, somebody said to me, something, 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 Africa. Yeah, because, you know, in Africa. And I'm like, well, we're in Africa. What <laughs> Africa? You know? Yeah. Would you just say in whatever? No, you're gonna give you're gonna give it a context. But you know, you're not gonna say ethnic cleansing in Europe, you'll say ethnic cleansing in Bosnia or Serbia or wherever. Can I just take a step back and say and just clarify when I said it's not it wasn't or it's not your uh, individual's rep responsibility to teach someone else, what I mean in the context is it's like the saying, I don't know if you've ever heard it when the student is ready to learn the teachers appears, the teacher appears. Absolutely. not somebody's responsibility to teach somebody who's not willing to learn Absolutely. yeah 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 so that's what i mean if it, it, it i mean it's exhausted enough to teach somebody who is willing to learn to make them understand but they but they are willing but they don't really get it so yeah. somebody who's resisting they'll get their wake-up call a bit 
well, they did get their well, you hope, of it. you hope they will. Because I'll be honest with you, that's one of the things I got, I got castigated for saying this in a public lecture years ago. And then I heard, you know, Dr. Joy de Gruyere when she mm. was talking about post-traumatic slave syndrome. And I went to the, I went to a lecture, I think it was at Euston Square or something. And she went, I've got something to tell you all. Some of you ain't going to make it. <laughs> and I remember I turned around to one of the people who critiqued me for saying that. And I goes, you see? You just have to be honest. Some people aren't mm. going to make it. Some people don't want to make it. Yeah. And you can't force them. You can't force blackness yeah. or Africanness on people. Half of my family in Jamaica, if I said to them, right, there's an African rally in, in down the road, let's go. Menago, after men are African. But if you say there's a black rally, they'll come. Do you know what is interesting? Levels of huh? consciousness. But what's interesting, I visited Jamaica, I've been there once in 2012, and I found a lot of the Jamaicans I encountered on the island embrace their African heritage. Because it's shifting. It's shifting. It's shifting. It depends on it depends on where you are and who you are with. Because as I said, I have I have some family in Jamaica right now who are just about learning that they're African. Mm. Especially some of the ones who've never traveled anywhere. Because you see what it is, and you can't really blame them because the no, thing that they're getting is what they get through the TV. Especially if they're not if they're not privy to or can't be bothered to read around stuff. So what they will do is get these misrepresentations. And I've, you know, you've travelled. I've travelled. You see how as Africans we're represented on this planet. And and that ties into a conversation that you and I have had on on multiple occasions about the importance of understanding history, the history of racism and about your own culture and identity alongside with that, is if yeah. you don't have that understanding, you become an empty vessel. Yeah. Things are projected onto you. Yeah. You learn about it through somebody else. Yeah. And so get that their is version. Another, that, and our, 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 our family, and I say family because as black people in that sense we unite, is that they were encouraged to disconnect from that yeah. by way of slavery, the names, their identity. So, yeah. I mean, as I've got older, I've got a better understanding for what this goes back to, again, to studying the history of racism. Then you understand the why they feel the way they do. Those yeah. set of, those, those particular people who have that view, once again, it's not everyone. But yeah. once you understand the system, racism, you understand why we think the way we think. Yeah. And how, if we think it's a problem, we can try and unlearn it or relearn things yeah yeah sister Trima, i know you've got some really strong views about like a lot of this stuff that's going on you know about um tearing down statues and mm-hmm. whatever it is but you've got an interesting take because you think that we need to be more like legally astute we need to understand mm-hmm. like legislature if, if that's the word and that whole process, the parliamentary process. So, so what, what's your take on that? Law and governance, because it really is the foundation for everything. I know America has a, a constitution and we have, um, in this country, we have acts of parliament and court judgments and what have you, that form a kind of unwritten constitution, if I can say that. It's not in the yeah. same way as America, but well, essentially it has official. the same function. Yeah. yeah. Once we can go back, once we can find a way to understand that, or at least develop an understanding of that, we can understand how things unfold when a situation like what's happened before has happened, how the law does or doesn't make people accountable and what have you in that sense. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to understand, because as you said, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, with the tearing downs of statues and what have you, okay, it's making a statement, however people see it positive or negative, it's making a statement, we need to make a difference. And making, and I think, going back, as I said, I think we were talking about this earlier. So for example, in the the United States of America, and we know we're not in America, but we're talking about the West. Yeah. A gentleman like Donald Trump is very, 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 very wealthy. He's at the top of his game in terms of his achievements. And, um, just thinking about why somebody like him who's, you know, 
achieved what he has, very accomplished, would make the transition into politics. You need to question that. And oh, we need to question that. And he makes that transition from what I've read and understand because he understands that politics is power, law is power, governance is power. And in, in putting his mark or making the transition into that arena, forming and shaping and influencing policy there protects his interests and people like him or a particular sector of society. Yeah. Like it's not for nothing. So I think in our, in our journey as black people in the diaspora, a lot of us have, um, we've developed, we progress. We have a lot of celebrities. Our earning power is strong. Our spending power is stronger. That's an imbalance. That's something, that's economics. That's another conversation. But just acknowledging that the money that's in our communities now doesn't necessarily equate to power. Buying a business doesn't mean having the power alone. It's about how much political influence you have, how we're represented in parliament or by our MPs. Do they reflect the constituencies that they serve? That kind of thing, educating ourselves in that sense understanding how laws change and how it could affect what we have, what we do, how we're housed. Yeah. So this is why I think we have, um, well, I know certainly myself as an individual, I would like to, you know, peel myself right back, humble myself and say that I have, you know, got two degrees, but there's a lot more I need to learn about other things in order to understand, in order to anticipate what might happen in the future, how the black community across the UK will be affected. Yeah. Um, oh, to me, it's interesting when you're saying that because what, what, for me, what you're basically saying is we need to be more politically astute so we can plan and prepare for what's coming next. Not what we think is coming next, but what is coming next. Because if you study those things and you study those patterns, you know what's coming next. And I know, I know um, one of the things that, you know, I heard you say before, was the fact that people think that their wealth will protect them. And one of the clear things about this pandemic, whether you believe it or not, is one of the class groups who've been decimated are the middle classes in America who are lining mm -hmm. up at food banks because they've gone from this to that and they don't have a welfare system. So I know you've got some, kind of like some interesting thoughts about the difference between us thinking wealth is power and being understanding the political system and the games and how it works is power. So I don't know if you if you briefly want to. Do that. I'd say, I'd say collectively. Okay. It's it's a kind of interchangeable thing. It, it influences each other. It goes it goes hand in hand. I would say. So that's why I go back to saying um, we need to understand that process. No matter how how accomplished we say we, we may be or we are or how educated we are we really that should be compulsory i think <laughs> really it should be a compulsory subject yeah, sure. it should be a com it, it really should because it's everything it's everywhere now if we look at what's happened in america with george floyd the policeman will be tried he'll go through a whichever way whatever the outcome he's going to go through a legal process isn't he true true so it, it somehow everything reverts back to that by default, Absolutely. well, not by default, by them. But yeah. it's it, even understanding like the uh, the ruling classes. If we take our emotions out of it and we just try and think like you know that top sector, you want to protect your interest, wouldn't you? Really, if you put yourself in in their shoes, you would want to do that. Absolutely. And you planning for the next five years wouldn't be enough. You'd have to plan for the next generation. Yeah. And sometimes I think, I don't know if it's a survival, but from my experience and what I've encountered, sometimes I think we don't look much further than this generation and, our, and uh, the next generation. And we should be looking a lot further than that. Yeah, true. Absolutely. Because people, yeah. people who are shaping policy do look at that. Yeah. They anticipate what... What, and they use statistics as well to anticipate what impact certain laws will have yeah. decades to come. Yeah. So, Sis Natrima, what can you surprise us? What is a surprising thing about 
you or your works that that maybe people wouldn't realize like people like me say surprise you okay a, su <laughs> a, a surprising thing that i would say is so surprising it even surprises myself is that my book that i wrote in 2015 my first book melanin monologues a black british perspective um it really has taken a life of its own in the sense that in america there are at the moment i think four universities or five including the university of texas and mary baldwin in virginia and what they've done is they've and annually they've set up a melanin monologues event spoken word poetries wow. re recitals i think they call it over there and it's just giving students academics the opportunity to have a platform and speak about their um experiences of race and to my understanding some of those universities it's not just exclusively black students i think wow. yeah. south american and and um so they've done that and in America, another lady's written a book with the title Melanin Monologues, but she's called it A Queer Woman's Perspective. Um, she, so what I'm trying to say is, and I know that the book is, yeah, yeah, the book is in Sweden, it's gone to South America, it's in Australia, the book is in New Zealand, it's hit my homeland of Ghana. So what I'd say is a surprising thing that a book that I wrote after being inspired by yourself and being inspired to talk about race from an observational perspective mm. and critical in terms of analysis. Yeah, oh it's, yeah, it's, it's a brilliant. It, thank you, it's really taken a life of its own. Yeah. People have embraced it and I, I, it's called a black British perspective, but it's gone beyond Britain. Mm. And I'm, I'm surprised and proud of that, that it encourages people to think about race, how, their idea of race has been shaped or influenced. And I said, for, for me, being black was prescriptive because it's my sense of my blackness is what was projected onto me. This is what blackness is and this is how you're going to think about it. So back then I said my race, my, my identification as a black woman was prescriptive. It was prescribed to me. Yeah. This is how you're going to feel about yourself by way of media and education. So, so that's the surprising thing It's the book has a life of its own. What about you said Concept. someone you said someone had a book Melanin Monologues like a queer theory or a something? Queer, a queer woman's perspective. So queer, what, I think did, that, they, did they acknowledge you? Are you acknowledged in that book? The disappointing thing about that lady in Australia is no. She surprise, so surprise. what there's a surprise. To <laughs> to what I can see, she hasn't she hasn't acknowledged, which I think is sad because You've got, she's obviously got the concept from course, me, yeah. but... It's, we call it teething or <laughs> plagiarism. Yeah, it is, but no, it is. And it, it, it's, bit, I don't want to say bittersweet, but it's a double-edged sword for me because I feel it would have been common courtesy to acknowledge where you got well, the idea from. But then at the same time, when I put this book out there and I spoke to the universe, I said, I want people to think about race. I don't want people to look at what is presented in the media and take it just yeah. at face value to really critically yeah. think about it. And now it's, words have vibrations, now it's happening. Unfortunately, it's not under the best circumstances, but people are talking about race. Yeah, and, and to be honest, people done. should look at your book because one, you know, you're one of the younger up and comings and two, it's just a really reflective and rigorous account of what it's like to be a woman of African ancestry, a black woman in yeah. Britain. And what you'll see is anybody who can, anybody who can kind of empathize with that experience will be able to, do, will be able to do so. So they don't necessarily have to be an African person because I'll bet you any money Loads of indigenous peoples in, in, in America will embrace that book because they understand what that suffering is, you know? And I just think it's, 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 I just say give thanks because, you know, you're one of the few people who will put something out and it takes on its own dynamic. And that's why you should really give yourself a round of applause because that is an amazing achievement because what it is is, you know, and you, you said this to me before, 
it's ancestral. You're driven. Your ancestors speak through you. And therefore, they will speak to others who understand that ancestral link and connection. We're not self-generated people. You know, that was your works. That's what you blessed mm -hmm. us with. And that's why it's taken on its own dynamic, because it's real. But even in writing it, Professor Les, I had to almost second guess myself because I thought to my, I, I've seen, I've seen instances where you, you, we see people in the media who speak about black issues and speak about black pride and they're kind of accused of being militant on what have you. Yeah. And so at first I thought, oh, you know, this is going to be taken the wrong way. And then I had to kind of have a conversation with myself and my mum had a conversation with me as well I thought to myself, but it's your story. It's your truth. Absolutely. And that's and the bottom line. If you're offended by it or you feel that it's attacking you, then this is a great opportunity to have a conversation. Why do you feel like it's attacking you? Yeah, yeah. Because I said I went somewhere and I was dressed in a certain way and somebody assumed I didn't speak English. Why would you be offended like that? I didn't say, oh, I hate you. I turned up at the airport and the immigration guy at clearing thought I didn't speak English. I never said that. I just said it was interesting because yeah. I came with an African attire. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, See, that's, that, that's, that's, that's the kind of thing. But to me, that's the beautiful thing about when, you, when you're confident and you can be reflexive. That's what it is. You're confident because you know who you are. No one can tell you what you are. Or, yeah. Because it's like the beautiful metaphor you used about the empty vessel. Yeah. If the vessel's empty, people can fill it with whatever the hell they want. But if you've already filled it with pride in yourself as an African person, what can they say? And then in some ways you flip the script and you say, well, what is your problem with me celebrating my Africanness? I'm not a threat awesome. to you. I'm not saying, you know, you're the devil and you shouldn't be here. Exactly. But why am I so threatening to you? That's the real story. And the real or what story. don't you like? And the thing is about this book, and this goes back to what I say about, I don't know if we mentioned this about people like yourself, Professor Les, are so important. And in your book, I believe it's Whiteness Made Simple. Yeah. What's the other book of yours, Dr. Les, where you're on top of the pyramid in the blue oh, background? Oh, that's the Carry Beyond Reflections, my lyricism, mm -hmm. yeah. Not yeah. the lyricist book. It was Whiteness Made Simple. And you talked about goal models yeah and for me you are, you have been my goal model in the last six years because i've seen somebody who looks like me who's a black person who grew up in the same community as me so this is where my mum and i can't identify with each other because her community was slightly different yeah. and you've kind of you had had low expectations projected onto you at school and you've been able to excel and break through that ceiling. If I'd met you earlier, my life would be different because even I talked about in my book, being at school and coming up to my GCSEs and having predictions and my English teacher sitting me down, he wasn't shouting at me and saying to me, asking me what I want to achieve. I said to him more than a C because I want to go to university. He said to me, I'd be really, really, really happy if you got a Dina Trima, considering English is your second language. And for me, that was the turning point. Yeah. I was asleep before that, and then I woke up. Yeah, yeah. And in him saying that to me, if I followed what he felt I would be able to achieve, I would never think it was possible to write a book or go to Goldsmiths University and get a master's degree or be enrolled in a PhD program. Yeah. And in that sense, he was my teacher in school, but you and people like you were my teacher in life in a practical sense. You know, so humbled and give thanks because I've had great teachers. You know, I've had great teachers. You know, one of mine, Professor Herbert Ekwekwe, peace be upon him, passed last year. Yes. The cleverest human being I ever met. And it was only, it only dawned on me when he passed and I realized he was only three years older than me. Mm -hmm. When I met him, I was 25 and he was 28. And the guy was, he just knew everything. He was exceptional. He knew everything about everything. And I kid you not, I have never been able to ask him anything. 
that he couldn't address. You could ask him about the most obscure Eastern European political system, and he would tell you. I've never met anyone like that. Yeah. But Professor Les, he was knowledgeable. We've got a lot of knowledgeable people around us, but yeah. he was knowledgeable about things that would help you develop as a person. Absolutely. And that's what counts. Yeah. True. True you don't just want somebody who's going to be knowledgeable about what's happening in popular culture to distract us and yeah. make us think that, <laughs> you know, we're accomplished. Yeah. And it took, it, it, it took somebody, there's something that gentleman could teach you. He might not have been your English teacher or what he might have come later in your life, but there's something he taught you yeah. about your ability to do something. There's something he saw in you that you couldn't yet see for yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and now on the head. And we, we need that in our, and I think it should be, I think it should be compulsory for young black students to even have mentors, to be honest with you, especially when it comes to self-esteem building. Yeah. Because when you have people who have confidence present themselves, develop themselves. It, I was watching a documentary about, um, I'm going to jump back to the West Indies now. Um, she's an MP. What's her name? Lisa Hanna. It came up on my notifications in Jamaica. And I don't know what she's like politically in that sense, but her confidence. Yeah. She believes she can do, she believes she can do anything. She has that confidence and that accompanies her academic achievements. Because if you don't believe you can do something, you won't even try. You've already failed. Absolutely. So that's where I think not all, but some some of us older and younger black people are lacking in self-esteem and confidence yeah and it goes back to a self of identity and value yeah and, and 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 it is that because if you continue to depend on especially this extremely racist anti-african well they're the ones who, who introduced this notion of african chattel enslavement and the human yeah. you know they're the ones who introduced this notion of african chattel enslavement and dehumanized us if you're dependent on them for a sense of self as an african person you're finished exactly. because it's not their job and it's not their purpose and it's not in their interest to do that because if you look at some of these mps now like this one who's on tv for bend the knee comes from the game of thrones right. you have to really question what the hell do these people know what do they know? Because one of the things what I think has happened in this, in this time is people are realising you, you cannot equate a so-called posh accent with intellect. Mm. No. You cannot equate a posh accent with wisdom. Mm. They just don't necessarily go hand in hand. What can you give us to take away? What can the Trima give the people who are watching right now to take away. You've given them a woolly belly full of food already. <laughs> now we just want, you know, some yam and banana to go with the planting. Then yeah. Well it it sounds very cliche and it sounds very um I think maybe corny, but black people we just we have to be good to each other. We need to be kind to each other. It's hard out there we can make progress, we have made progress, but we have to support each other at home and empower each other and uplift each other. Mm. We have to have self-esteem and I think having self-esteem, what can boost our self-esteem as well in, as well as having mentors or people we can reason with who are more experienced than ourselves, but it's about learning about our history and our accomplishments. That We have had some negative traumatic experiences, but we have overcome some incredible hurdles absolutely and that should be if nothing else that should be our motivation the first wave of us who came here african or caribbean what have you the first wave of large wave of black people who came here encountered a lot but had made some kind of a platform for us to stand upon regardless of how big or small you think it is there is a platform and we should only be building upon that Brilliant. And we have to appreciate what they had up against them at that time or yeah. what they didn't have in their favour. Yeah. And I think that when it comes to being black, not just educating ourselves about our history, educating yourself about politics, because it's almost like um, it can give you an idea of where things are going economically, how things are going politically, the powers that B 
be do that they look at statistics in order to make plans in order to see how things are venturing and also i want to say for us now if we say black lives matter i'm talking about black people now because we should be committed to this process. We can't opt in and out of it because we can't opt in and out of our yeah. blackness. We can't change our blackness. And don't confuse our blackness with black and minority ethnic, black Asian minority Ex ethnic. Our experiences exactly. are our own, yes. Exactly. If we're committed to Black Lives Matter as much as we say we are, as much as we shout we are, we protest we are, we have to show that commitment by being selfless because this is bigger than us now. It's yeah. bigger than our most wealthiest person. This is something that has to continue. This commitment to empowering ourselves and building ourselves up. We have to be selfless. When you think about educating yourself or start about that business, start a business or sell a business, think about how it can affect your wider community and the generations to come. True. If you think about, and this is even an individual level, because as an individual because collectively we all come together to form a community if you're thinking about doing something that's not right sounds condescending but breaking the law what have you think about how that impacts your community how it impacts your future goals if there was things you did in the past dr les that were very 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 detrimental to your development when you decided you want to better yourself you wouldn't have the opportunity to because that would be an instant um disqualification in the way this system works absolutely but look at what you've done you've built yourself up you've developed yourself but you make you you don't just make a statement in what you've achieved you make a difference for people who are coming after you you yeah. open those doors someone opened the door for you and yeah. professor les you held it open and now I have to get to a certain point and hold it open for someone. Other people and have to do the same. That's such a beautiful attitude because I always say to people, I am of my community. And the best example I can give you, because we've got a close, but the best example I can yeah. give you, when I put my first book out and I was showing it to, I was showing it to my brethren. Yeah. Upper Broccoli Road when they had the food shop there. So those are- Oh, people, the you, takeaway. Yeah, the takeaway. So I was outside the takeaway, literally 2006. I think I put the book out in September 2006. Really? I'm outside, the, I'm outside the, the food shop and I'm talking to one of my brethren and he said to me, oh, what's that? I said, why is my book, you know? And he said, why? He's not a reader, you know, Dr. Les, but how much for? And I said, 15 quid. And he just took out 15 quid and bought it to support me. Mm. And then one bag of people came and did exactly the same thing because they knew I'm representing them. Yes. And that was the difference. And I remember it's always stuck with me and I've always said it to people. He said, I'm not a reader, but I'm going to support you. Because I said to him, you know, I self-published it. I gave him a little bit, cause, you know, we are reason. I'm going to say, yeah, I offered it to academic publisher. They've never wanted. Got my money together, put it out myself. And it's like, and oftentimes, I will bump into my brethren them, you know, who I grew up with, and they'll say, yes, yeah, so Dr. Les, you have any new book, and blah, 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 and they'll just buy them, because they know that's what the works is. But, if we don't Dr. support Le each other, we're done. But Professor Les, people don't, people who have, an, people who have um, ambitions to write, people who look like you and I, who are behind us coming up in terms of youth, don't know that it's possible to have a passion have a good idea and something positive to say. <clears throat> Nobody want it and then they can do it themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what no. good examples of that right here? It, exactly. And my teacher told, and, and just one more thing, sorry, I do want to say, my teacher, it's all fair and well that this particular gentleman told me what he thought I couldn't do. Yeah. But at the same time, to balance things out, why didn't he tell me what he thought I could do? Exactly, exactly. Do you know, I often say that to young people. I say to them, when I work with young people, mm -hmm. I say to them, how many times have people in your life said to you, you can do that, as opposed to, you can't do that. And that's it in a nutshell. And when you're black, it's even worse. Because you've got that story about what they told you at school. At school, the teacher said to me, oh, Henry, you're too thick to do a thinking man's job. 
you better go and work in the in the biscuit factory or on a building site. Yeah, I was in the highest class. Malcolm X, I want to be a lawyer, be a carpenter. Jesus was a carpenter. It's interesting how it's it's very interesting how that narrative never changes. But Dr. Les, I was just gonna say, because you just you sparked it in me. When you when your teacher told you you better go and work in a factory. You better go and do this. Another yeah. thing I don't think we realise, how we can still have successful and tangible careers working in factories because you can use that factory money to do something independently. Absolutely. But for so, me, it's that reductionist bit. Because you know I'm a qualified plumbing and heating engineer. Yes, I remember. I'm an industrial pipe fitting. So I'm used to getting down and deep and dirty. But to me, it's when someone wants to reduce you to that. One of yeah. my daughters, who's in her 20s, went through that. That same thing. And it's only because they stopped me from going up to school and roasting the careers person. Mm -hmm. But it's almost like this constant thing because it's like they don't want to see your potential, but more importantly, they don't want you to see your potential. Did you say you were going to go to the school to roast a careers person? Yeah. You see, <laughs> that's what I would have loved my mum to do to my teacher. But my mum's got a different view. We're all, we're all part of the revolution, but we all build ourselves up in different ways. Absolutely. My mum said, said to me, she, she said to me, I said, go down to school and, you know, talk to him. She said to me, she said, Natrima, I'm not going to go down to the school and talk to him. You make sure if there's one subject you get, it's that subject. And let the, let the accomplishment or achievement speak for itself. <laughs> and when I got it, he was encouraging me to do English A-level. Yeah. yeah. So you have to... Yeah. Get the result. So, Sister Natrima, it's been yeah. a pleasure reasoning with you. Okay. And out of you where reason comes first, another yeah. exemplary um, take. And I give thanks. Stay blessed and stay focused. And until such time. Thank you.